the attempts to break into the Western market have become a staple for K-pop groups for the last few years. While in the past, companies put focus on the Japanese and Korean market, now everyone seems to be giving it a shot to chart on Billboard or sell out a tour in North America. But why is it breaking into the Western music market the biggest mistake that K-pop groups are making? Appealing to markets outside of Korea isn't a new concept in K-pop. More often than not, groups release versions of songs and albums in Japanese or even make entirely new tracks in other languages. Some groups even debut with members of different nationalities so they can find it easier to promote outside of Korea, and trainees are required and encouraged to learn a second language, usually Japanese. This is more than understandable seeing as Japan has the second largest consumer market in the world, and K-pop groups have been quite successful in appealing to the Japanese fans. Boa topped Japanese charts in 2002 with her debut Japanese album Listen to My Heart, becoming the first Korean singer to do so. She paved the way for second generation groups like Kuda, Girls' Generation, and Big Bang. After Japan, K-pop tried their hand in the Chinese market. This too made sense since China is the third largest consumer market in the world. SM Entertainment is especially known for catering to the Chinese market with SM groups having Chinese subunits like XOM and Super Junior M. However, the political relations between the two countries have worsened the past few years, which has limited the import of K-pop between the two countries and has made companies pay more attention to the West. Entertainment agencies saw the appeal of the Western market a long time ago, starting with the second generation, but their attempts were not successful whatsoever. Wonder Girls, for example, had it easy to become popular in Korea shortly after they debuted. Their song Tell Me brought back the trend of girl groups in Korea and became a hit across the country. They won trophies on Music Bank for two months straight, and you basically couldn't go anywhere without hearing it. You could argue that by the time nobody came out, Wonder Girls were the most popular group in Korea. Because of their success domestically, JYP thought that they could expand to the West easily. Due to his frequent visits to the United States, JYP got in contact with the managers of Jonas Brothers and struck up an agreement to get Wonder Girls with the group as the group's opening act for the North American leg of their world tour, which totaled an eventual 45 concert dates. That marked the beginning of the end for them, as this decision harmed them in all aspects. As they were touring in the US with Jonas Brothers, they lost all of their momentum in their home country. With Girls' Generation releasing G in early January of 2009 and Wonder Girls leaving in February, and touring overseas, they had no chance to compete with G, and their popularity started fading away even more during the tour. The members also had a hard time when they were away. They had been away from their home country for months, traveling non-stop, and were worked to the bone. But JYP's delusion about the Western perception of K-pop didn't end there. The concerts weren't complete flops, but they weren't successful either. Unfortunately, this gave JYP the idea that he could break into the American market using Wonder Girls. They had a tour in North America, leading to to the members being away for three years, released only two singles, both of which completely failed, and in the end, they came back home to just realize that Girls' Generation was now the leading group in South Korea, which meant that they had to start all over again. So not only did JYP's plan for expansion in the West not work, but it also damaged Wonder Girls to a dangerous extent. JYP himself admitted that pushing Wonder Girls in the US was a huge mistake. When he appeared on Radio Star, he shared that he planned to debut three groups in 2008, but the plans failed leading him to think that Wonder Girls had a chance. DEF CON then said that his plan to break Wonder Girls in the West is the worst disaster, making JYP show his regret. This is what companies are not considering when they're trying to produce content and material to cater to Western audiences. Even though being popular in the West might seem like the end goal for some entertainment companies, they're unaware of what they're actually gambling away by focusing only on the international audience. Whatever the general public is interested in, they're going to lose this interest if the group that they like is only releasing content to appeal to fans of other countries. SM Entertainment made the same mistake. After they attempted to introduce Boa to the Western music market and failed, they tried the same with Girls' Generation. Yes, after JYP's failed attempt with Wonder Girls. Following their undeniable success in Korea, they tried to break the group into the West. Up until then, they were known for their innocent, feminine image and their distinct bubblegum pop sound. However, SM knew that the cute concept wouldn't be successful in the West, so if they were to ever get popular there, they would have to try a more mature concept. This is how The Boys was born. It was an electro-pop dance track which came in both Korean and English, in addition to an EDM remix featuring none other than Snoop Dogg. The song became an instant hit in Korea, considering that the girls' vocals in the song were outworldly, the choreography was fierce, and the track itself was amazing. But the target audience didn't like it as much as SM expected. Girls' Generation did try their best promoting the song in the West. They performed on The Late Show with David Letterman and live with Kelly and Michael in 2009, 
in February of 2012, two months after the release of the English version of the track. Even if there were people who enjoyed the song, the West wasn't ready for K-pop yet. Seeing a group with nine members was confusing to them, and the boys turned out to be too tame for the top 40, but too Western for K-pop. The only success that the song saw was peaking at number five on the Billboard Hot Dance single sales chart, and that was basically it. The one group that had the potential to hit it big in the US market was 21. They had a completely different sound and concept than the other K-pop girl groups at the time, a sound that had a better appeal to the American culture. But as it always is, YG pulled the plug on this opportunity rather quickly. 21 was supposed to release a US debut album in collaboration with Will I Am. It was reported that they had produced 10 tracks in total, and both the rapper and YG confirmed that the album was in the works, but then it never came out, so any chances that the group had of expansion in the West fizzled out altogether. It seems like the issue was that the companies tried to Americanize the artists that they were trying to promote, and in the process, the K-pop artists and groups lost the element that made them enjoyable in the first place. The narrow-mindedness of the Western audiences was also to blame, as they considered the K-pop sound cringe at the time. The fans back then agreed that all companies should have done is promote the groups normally and not change them completely. This is why BTS became successful in America in 2016 and 2017. They didn't change their sound to adapt to the American audience. The already existing BTS fans could enjoy their performances and promotions in the West, knowing that the group was delivering the same product in South Korea and America. But ever since they broke into the West, it's become standard practice for companies to try and market their groups in America, and the pressure to become big in the West has become as huge as ever. By now, every group is trying their hand to break into the US. They're releasing songs and albums in English, collaborating with Western artists, trying to follow Western music trends, and promoting comebacks on American daytime and nighttime shows. All of this is done so new potential fans can find it easier to try and get introduced to the group's discography through songs that sound like every pop track that you hear on the radio. Some of these songs have also gotten casual listeners to try getting into K-pop. However, groups have yet to reach the success that groups like BTS and Blackpink have reached in the West, and along the way, it looks like they're also losing a part of their identity as K-pop artists. In the past, a group had to be super successful in Korea for the company to consider breaking them into the West, but now it seems that companies won't wait long before giving their groups English tracks and sending them to do shows in North America. But even with English versions of Korean songs, it seems that the sound that made K-pop songs so unique and different has now been replaced with generic beats and lyrics that don't make sense. While this K-pop sound has also been influenced by the West, producers and idols used to give these songs their own spin, which now seems to be gone. Save for the different language, now K-pop songs mostly sound gentrified and do not embody the essence of K-pop. Not only that, but the company seemed to have overlooked some things when trying to expand into the West. One of them is being wrong about what the American audience prefers. The next thing is the cultural differences. For international fans who are of different races and cultures, it's strange to see K-pop companies pushing their groups into the Western market so much when they don't even bother giving their idols cultural sensitivity training or trying to teach them more about the various cultures of their international community. The second generation of K-pop groups were notorious for xenophobia and homophobia, making tasteless jokes, and even committing literal crimes, so newer K-pop fans expected better from the upcoming generations. However, even idols who are young and have a sense of what's right or not due to the internet sometimes do things that offend others, like saying slurs or appropriating other cultures. In the past, international K-pop stands didn't hold the idols to the same standards. Both xenophobia and homophobia don't have the same history and cultural context in South Korea than they have in the West. Looking at things from a Western lens, South Korea is far behind when it comes to these issues. Fans have argued that judging Koreans by Western standards is unfair since South Korea has had limited time to adapt to these standards. The influence of China and Imperial Japan, and the fact that Korea was closed off to the West has made socio-cultural norms develop very differently. No matter what the excuse is, however, this argument doesn't hold with how determined companies are to get their groups liked by the American public. While the cultural differences tend to be a big reason why idols are so ignorant, groups are curated to appeal to the fans and the public and to appear as squeaky clean and unproblematic as possible. So if companies still debut new groups without giving them any sort of training on cultural sensitivity, then it shows that they don't care about offending people enough to change how things work. Agencies have already started teaching their trainees about cultural sensitivity, but fans think that they should do more. Now that we've talked about all the downsides of companies focusing so much on the Western music market, we should see things from another perspective. With how fast the Korean entertainment industry is moving, it's getting harder and harder for groups that are not from a big company to break into the scene. Most groups debut under small companies, and once these companies see that the group isn't going viral or getting big in Korea,
Korea, they're going to be left in the basement and not have any comebacks until their eventual disbandment. There's also the case of a group having one hit, but then failing to gain traction again with the public. To put it simply, it's impossible for the Korean music market to support tons of groups that are debuting. However, some groups are just more popular overseas than they are in Korea, so they don't have the privilege to put all of their focus in their native country. Groups like Luna, ATs, Dreamcatcher, and The Boys have a lot more fans internationally than they do in Korea. So it makes sense for their companies to put all of their focus on the audience that they have overseas because that's where the money is. If Luna and Dreamcatcher didn't expand in the West or cater to the audience in the US, then they wouldn't be as successful as they are today. Some of these groups didn't even have their first win, but they were selling out shows internationally. So even though big K-pop companies are making their group lose their identities for a chance to make it in the West, entering the Western music market is the only chance that smaller groups have of surviving. However, it would be a lot better if agencies didn't try so hard, as it must be difficult for idols to see themselves as failures for not appealing to a whole different market. Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thanks for watching today's video. Bye!